We all understand that it's a very competitive process and slots are scarce. I, for one, would welcome the opportunity to bring that person to the attention of the Coast Guard Academy and help put him or her on a path to accomplishing much for themselves, their family, and the nation. With that, I reserve the balance of my time. Gentleman reserves his time. Gentleman from New Jersey. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I claim time in opposition. Gentleman is recognized. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I appreciate what Mr. Thompson is attempting to do here. However, I don't think this is, uh, this is workable. Um, every member of Congress would, every four years, get to nominate someone to the Coast Guard Academy. I, I send a number of uh, qualified young people in that direction every year. And the Coast Guard strongly opposes this amendment. And I yield Mr. Courtney uh, such time as he may consume. The gentleman is recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, as I rise in opposition uh, to this amendment, first of all, I just want to salute the amazing effort by Representative Cummings and Representative Thompson over the last four or five years to uh, really, I think, profoundly change behavior at the uh, Academy's admissions office uh, in terms of w forcing them to widen the scope of their search for qualified students all across America. In the incoming class this year, we have students who hail from 48 states. We have 31 percent female cadets starting this year and 21 percent minority. And as both of the gentlemen who are the proponents of this amendment knows that is a stark contrast to the situation that existed a short time ago. And I think, uh, again, it is partly due to their external pressure, but also the fact that the Coast Guard Academy's leadership took the challenge and has really been, I think, actively uh, recruiting all across the country to achieve what, I, again, I think is a, a goal that um, Mr. Thompson has well spoken, that we can draw from a, a wider pool uh, rather than just the bi-coastal uh, parts of, of the United States of America. Um, what I would just say uh, is, is why I stand today in opposition is just that the incoming class is also a small class. It's 288 cadets. Uh, if you sort of just try and do the math in terms of a, a body of 435 members of the House, 100 in the Senate, uh, and even with the 25 percent um, safeguard that Mr. Thompson thoughtfully added to this amendment, uh, again, I think it really it would just be a cumbersome add-on to a process that really, again, is actively engaged. Uh, Admiral Sandra Stos is the new superintendent at the Academy, the first female superintendent of a military academy in American history, and I can just attest to the fact, having met with her on a number of Occasion since she just started this past fall, she has focused like a laser beam in terms of making sure that the great work that was started over the last two years or so is going to continue. And members can be part of that. We can all, again, go out and talk to high schools, uh, put it on our websites, have Coast Guard cadets act as, as interns in our office, do what we can to make sure that this amazing institution that, again, is, is just producing great leaders for the future of our country will draw on, again, the great diversity of our nation, both geographically and socially. So, again, I support the goal of this amendment. It's just the mechanics that, uh, again, I would just respectfully rise in opposition and, uh, again, pledge that that as someone who represents the New London District uh, will continue to work with the proponents to make sure that the good progress that's been made over the last couple of years or so will continue. And with that, I yield back. Gentleman from Mississippi. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I recognize the gentleman from Mass Maryland, Mr. Cummings, for as much time as he may consume. Gentleman from Maryland is recognized. I want to thank you, uh, Congressman Thompson. Uh, thank you for your leadership and thank you for your kind words. Um, I'm truly amazed by what the Coast Guard is able to accomplish, particularly given the limits of his budget, but I remain the Coast Guard's biggest supporter. During my tenure as chairman, I also had the opportunity to be the service's most constructive critic. Among the many areas where I pushed the Coast Guard to set and achieve higher goals was the area of diversity. Data presented to the subcommittee showed that minorities comprised approximately 12 percent of the class of 2012 and just 16 percent of the class of 2013. By comparison, approximately 35 percent of the Naval Academy's class of 2013 is comprised of minorities. The tremendous gains in diversity achieved by the United States Naval Academy suggested that the uh, Coast Guard Academy's outreach uh, had been too limited. And as a result, many students across the country from a wide variety of communities and backgrounds simply were not, being, not made aware either of the education that they could receive for free at the Coast Guard Academy or the unique uh, service opportunities available in the Coast Guard. I'm very proud to say that the Coast Guard has begun making that effort 
and they are now beginning to realize the promise that our nation's diversity represents. As a result of what I know has been a tremendous effort, 34 percent of the Coast Guard's Academy's class of 2015 is comprised of minority students and nearly triple the percentage of minority in the class of 2012. I believe that implementing a nominations process at the Coast Guard Academy, something that I proposed during, uh, along with Mr. Thompson during our consideration of previous Coast Guard authorizations, will help and continue and uh, advance the achievements of the Coast Guard. With that, I yield back to the gentleman. Gentleman's time has expired. Gentleman from New Jersey. Reserve. Gentleman reserves. Well, all the gentleman's time has expired. Oh, okay, I, I yield back. Or I, uh, I yield back my time. Gentleman yields back his time. The question is on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Mississippi. Those in favor say aye. Those opposed, no. no. Opinion of the chair, the noes have it. The amendment is not agreed to. Mr. Chairman, I ask for a recorded vote. Pursuant to Clause 6 of Rule 18, further proceedings on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Mississippi will be postponed. It is now in order to consider Amendment Number 5, printed in House Report 112-267. For what purpose does the gentleman from Mississippi seek recognition? Purpose of an amendment. The clerk will designate the amendment. Amendment Number 5, printed in House Report Number 112-267, offered by Mr. Palazzo of Mississippi. Pursuant to House Resolution 455, the gentleman from Mississippi, Mr. Palazzo, and a member opposed, each will control five minutes. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Mississippi. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my amendment would strike Section 303 of the bill, which places harmful restrictions on the future contracting and construction of the United States Coast Guard National Security Cutter. The National Security Cutter is a much needed and extremely cost effective ship for the Coast Guard and has actively proven its value through highly successful counter drug and other missions while replacing an aging Coast Guard fleet. This is a ship the Coast Guard desperately needs and replaces the 370 foot endurance cutters, most of which are 40 to 50 years old. Just recently, the Commandant of the Coast Guard told the press, we, can get the rest, we can't get the rest of these out soon enough. On average, the Coast Guard's legacy high endurance cutters are able to achieve approximately 140 of their programmed 185 days underway a year. Maintenance costs continue to escalate and further delay of the transition to national security cutters will only exasperate challenges we are already facing meeting fleet readiness and mission requirements. This ship represents the centerpiece of the Coast Guard fleet. The first two national security cutters are enabling the Coast Guard to meet a wide range of missions now. During initial deployment, the national security cutters have netted hundreds of millions of dollars in drug busts. In fact, the street value of cocaine seized in the NSC's first two deployments alone exceeds the total cost of building a national security cutter. It is easy to see that this ship is an exceptional investment in our national security. As it currently stands, H.R. 2838 would prohibit the Coast Guard from moving forward on NSC-6 and NSC-7. The $77 million pending in FY12 will enable the Coast Guard to contract for long lead time materials and transition to a planned construction contract in fiscal year 13. This is the most cost effective method of procuring and building any ship, whether it's for the Coast Guard, Navy, or the Marine Corps. As you delay shipbuilding, contracts, labor costs and material costs go up as a result of standard inflation. As these costs go up, the cost of the taxpayers go up, called escalation. Simply put, by continuing to steady production of this ship, we are saving the taxpayers money and creating a better product for the Coast Guard. This ship is extremely important to our nation's industrial base, which already faces serious challenges in a time of tight budgets. National security cutters are responsible for 1,300 jobs in over 40 states throughout the industrial base. In a time of deep cuts, this means real American jobs. We can't afford for America to lose more in terms of economic and national security. The continued interruption, excuse me, production could potentially save the taxpayers millions of dollars per ship and approximately 1,300 jobs across America. One of my greatest concerns remains the purchase of long lead time materials to ensure that we do not delay production in the future. I have spoken with Mr. Lobiondo today and I believe that we can find a solution to this issue before or during the conference process. With the co cooperation of the Coast Guard and my friends on the committee, I feel confident we can continue to deliver the best product to the Coast Guard at the best possible price to the taxpayer. I am willing to withdraw my amendment. Um, I yield time, balance my time, Mr. Lobiondo. Gentleman is recognized. Um, yes, Mr. Speaker, I want to thank gentlemen from Mississippi 
and assure him that we have discussed and we will continue to work toward a common goal which we both share. Yield back. Mr. Speaker, I ask unanimous consent to withdraw my amendment. Without objection. It's ordered. The, amendment, the gentleman's amendment is withdrawn. It is now in order to consider Amendment Number 6, printed in House Report 112-267. For what purpose does a gentlewoman from California seek recognition? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk. The clerk will designate the amendment. Amendment Number 6, printed in House Report Number 112-267, offered by Mrs. Napolitano of California. Pursuant to House Resolution 455, the gentlewoman from California, Ms. Napolitano, and a member opposed. Each will control five minutes. The chair recognizes the gentlewoman from California. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I yield myself such time as I may consume. Gentlemen, he's recognized. Our bipartisan amen amendment gives United States flagged tuna vessels in the Western Pacific Ocean the option of using Guam in addition to American Samoa as their annual required port of call in order to meet U.S. maritime regulations. This amendment would save U.S. tuna industry millions of dollars and thousands of man hours that are needlessly wasted by being forced by the U.S. maritime regulations to travel 2,600 miles out of their way to make port visit. The background on this is that in 2006, Coast Guard Authorization Act allowed U.S. flagged tuna vessels in the Western Pacific to use internationally licensed officers. The international officer provision was created because maritime officers in the Western Pacific are primarily from Western Pacific nations. U.S. maritime unions were not opposed to the provision. In order to meet the requirements of that provision, the bill has required tuna vessels to make an por annual port call in American Samoa, some 2,000 miles away. In 2006, the tuna fleet in the region was very small at 12 boats, and American Samoa had a market to process the fish for those boats. Since 2006, however, the tuna fleet in the Western Pacific has grown to 38 vessels. Uh, Mr. Chairman, approximately 25 of those vessels supply fish to Western Pacific processors and then ship them fish product to California, to Georgia, to Illinois, to Puerto Rico for canning. These canneries provide thousands of U.S. jobs. These 25 vessels are still required to travel over 2,600 miles to American Samoa and waste seven days at sea. This costs each boat more than half a million to make this unnecessary trip. The purpose of this amendment is to give these tuna boats the option of stopping in Guam in order to meet the requirement of visiting a U.S. port once a year while receiving marine inspection by the largest Coast Guard sector station in the region. And, of course, Guam is very close to the tuna fishing grounds. Guam's Coast Guard infrastructure and personnel are excellently equipped to provide these tuna vessels with proper marine inspection and safety review on a timely basis. I urge all my colleagues to support this common sense amendment, which will save our U.S. tuna industry millions of dollars. The U.S. House of Representatives is already on record supporting this provision. The provision was part of the Coast Guard Authorization of 2009 that overwhelmingly passed this House. Mr. Chairman, I reserve the balance of my time. Gentlelady's time is reserved. Gentleman from Washington. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I, I uh, claim the time in opposition and yield the uh, time to Mr. Fallingman Vega. Gentleman is recognized. Mr. Speaker, I ask unanimous consent to extend and revise my remarks. Without objection, so And I rise respectfully in opposition to the gentlelady's proposed amendment. Mr. Speaker, perhaps unbeknown to many of my colleagues in the House, for more than 50 years, my little district of American Samoa has been the backbone of the U.S. tuna fishing and processing industries, just like Puerto Rico or the U.S. Virgin Islands have been the, the backbone of the rum industry. Today, the U.S. tuna processing industry includes three major brands of canned tuna, namely Bumblebee, Chicken of the Sea, and Starkist. Bumblebee was formerly owned by a Canadian company, then purchased by a U.S. investor and now resold to an investment group from Great Britain. Chicken of the Sea continues and has always been a subsidiary company of Thai Union, which currently is the world's largest producer of canned tuna. 
Starkist was formerly a subsidiary company of Heinz Foods Corporation out of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, then was sold to Del Monte out of San Francisco, and then it was purchased by the Don Juan Company out of S South Korea. All three of these major tuna processors companies have corporate offices in Pittsburgh and in San Diego. However, their methods of processing and canning of tuna are quite different, along with the manner in which our U.S. tuna fishing fleet has been operating given the tremendous change now taking place in the entire global tuna industry. I want to say that I have the utmost respect for my good friend, the gentle lady from California. And out of principle, I just want to respectfully say that uh, there's some very unique features of the situation and why I respectfully oppose the amendment. 80% of the entire economy of my district depends on the tuna industry. And if something happens in terms of the balance between the processors and our fishing fleet, this is where the problems and the complications have come about. To the extent that the South Pacific Tuna Corporation, uh, which owns about 25 of the 30 or 40 vessels that make up the U.S. tuna fishing fleet, the problem here is that we've got a problem of outsourcing. Where two of these companies, Chicken of the Sea and Bumblebee, do not process the whole fish as far as tuna is concerned. Ninety percent of the value of the tuna comes in the gutting and the processing. The canning is only about ten percent. And what has happened was that Chicken of the Sea and Bumblebee have chosen not to buy the whole fish, but to simply buy the loins of the fish that it was cleaned in foreign countries where workers there are paid only 60 cents an hour, as opposed to the only company that currently buys the whole fish, which is Starkist. They buy the whole fish and it provides jobs for my district. And because of the global economic recession that we have uh, experienced, and because of the terrible tsunami and earthquake that was subjected my people two years ago, one of the processing, processing companies, Chicken of the Sea, just took off after making billions of dollars worth of canned tuna in my little district, leaving the economy of my territory a disaster. What has happened is that there's another added feature of this whole problem of the tuna industry. We have what is now pending the U.S. Regional Tuna Fishing Treaty with 16 other Pacific Island countries. Part of the problem that came out of this treaty arrangement was because the tuna fishing fleet at the time felt that because tuna was a highly migratory fish, they can go anywhere in the, in the world of fish regardless of what the EEZ zones of these countries are. Well, they tried that in Latin America and we had our vessels uh, confiscated. So what, what happens, our tuna fishing fleet moved on to uh, the Western Pacific. And it was in that one incident that one of our purse sailors was confiscated by this little island country called the Solomon Islands, and the whole thing went up in here. It was necessary that then Secretary of State George Schultz and Mr. Neg uh, Negroponte came in, and this is how we started having this regional tuna fishing uh, treaty for and behalf of the benefit of our tuna fishing fleet. And this is how we tried to do to make sure to make sure that there is a, a constant supply of tuna that could be brought in to be processed whole fish by the two processing plants that we have in American Samoa. This is no longer the case. I respectfully ask my colleagues, vote down this proposed amendment, and I yield back. Jim yields back his time. General lady from California. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I yield one minute to Mr. Bilbrey. Gentleman from California is recognized for one minute. Thank you very much. Mr. Uh, Leader, I've got to say, quite frankly, I appreciate the gentleman from American Samoa um, and his position. I mean, if I represented that island, I would be wanting to defend the monopoly that island has in the, the uh, Western Pacific today. But the fact is, uh, as a nation, we've got to look at not only the great economic impact of this monopoly, of forcing boats to travel for thousands of miles to get back to one centralized location, 
because of a political decision here in Washington. But we've also got to look at this fact that the, the ladies uh, from California has an amendment that will address not just the economic impact, but what about the environmental? And I would ask uh, my colleagues on both sides of the aisle, consider the fact that we talk about greenhouse gases and emissions, but as a law, we're requiring these fishing boats to travel for six to seven days over thousands of miles because of our laws here. If we truly want to say we want to reduce emissions, we should reduce the emissions forced by regulation by supporting the ladies' amendment. And I yield back. Jennifer from Washington. Gentlemen from Washington's time has expired. Thank you, members. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Speaker, how much time do I have left? The gentlelady has one and one half minutes remaining. I yield the one and a half minutes to Ms. Bordello. The gentlelady from Guam is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise today in support of the amendment offered by my colleague from California, Grace Napolitano. While I am sympathetic to and recognize the concerns of my friend and colleague from American Samoa, I have received significant support from my constituents to include Guam as an eligible port of call for annual safety inspections only to the U.S. distant water tuna fleet. Permitting the fleet to call on Guam in addition to American Samoa will create additional economic opportunities for my constituents. The fleet can utilize Guam's Coast Guard sector, our port, our ship repair facilities, and service their helicopters. It is common sense approach to enforce the safety inspection requirements for the U.S. flagged vessels. But I want it to be very clear, Mr. Speaker, I would like better assurance from the administration, industry, and stakeholders that this will not harm the tuna industry in American Samoa. That industry is critically important uh, to their economy, and its competitive advantages must not be undermined. I am committed to working with my friend to ensure the American Samoa tuna industry remains strong. In fact, I am staunchly opposed to the distant water tuna fleet fishing in Guam's waters. The fleet is in fact prohibited from fishing in Guam's economic zone, and if it were to do so, it would threaten the livelihoods of our own local fishermen. If this amendment passes, I would strongly urge the Coast Guard, National Marine Fisheries Service, and all relevant agencies to aggressively enforce existing regulations and prevent any illegal opportunist harvest in Guam's waters. And again, I support this amendment, and I yield back. question is on the amendment offered by the gentlelady from California. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. Independent of the chair, the uh, no's Speaker, have it. I ask for the a's and a's. Pursuant to Clause 6 of Rule 18, further proceedings on the amendment offered by the gentlelady from California will be postponed. It is now in order to consider Amendment Number 7, printed in House Report 112-267. For what purpose does the gentleman from New York seek recognition? Mr. Speaker, I have an amendment at the desk. Clerk will designate the amendment. Amendment Number 7, printed in House Report Number 112-267, offered by Mr. Bishop of New York. Pursuant to House Resolution 455, the gentleman from New York, Mr. Bishop, and a member opposed will each control five minutes. The chair recognizes the gentleman from New York. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my amendment amends Title VII of the Coast Guard Reauthorization Bill to recognize the importance of both federal and state efforts to protect the waters of individual states by retaining a limited surgical role for states to provide additional operational limitations to protect important state resource waters from the in introduction of invasive species and other pollutants. I agree in concept with Chairman Lobiondo that we should enact a stringent, uniform national standard for ballast water treatment technologies for commercial vessels. It makes sense to set a high standard that is technologically achievable and reduces the likelihood of invasive species into our native waters. My amendment does not add or change any technological requirements in the bill. Let me say that again. My amendment does not add or change any technological requirements in the bill. This is an issue of extreme importance to industry for understandable reasons. Nor does it give states carte blanche to prevent ships from releasing ballast water. It simply provides for the ability of states to petition the federal government under a set of criteria that protects international and domestic commerce to identify and protect highly sensitive water resources within a state's existing jurisdiction. My amendment is not without precedent. 
In 1996, Congress amended the Clean Water Act to require the Department of Defense to work with the EPA to regulate ballast water uh, from military vessels, vessels through the Uniform National Discharge Standard Program. In providing for these uniform national standards, the then Republican-led Congress acknowledged a deep respect for the rights of states, including a res residual authority for states to establish no discharge zones similar to those that would be allowed under my amendment if it were to pass. Section 312 of the Clean Water Act, which is probably the closest analogy to the issue of ballast water discharges from commercial vessels, establishes uniform standards for discharges of marine sanitation devices. Section 312 specifically reserves a role for states to create no discharge zones for important state waters, provided that those zones will not adversely impact vessels from operating within the state. <clears throat> the issue really boils down to this. If you believe that states have a role to play, however limited, in determining if some of their state waters deserve additional protections while maintaining a uniform national standard, then you should vote for the Bishop Amendment. If, on the other hand, you believe that states should have absolutely no say whatsoever in protecting particularly sensitive waters within their jurisdiction, then you should oppose the Bishop Amendment. Given what we've done thus far in this Congress, I would hope that members would continue to assert that states have a role. Earlier this year, the rule, we passed uh, H.R. 2018, the Cooperative Federalism Act, Act of 2011. This bill would eliminate any federal role in setting baseline water quality standards, giving full discretion to the states. The bill that is before us flips that precisely. It would provide no role for the states and give 100 percent of the role to the federal government. So I would ask uh, that uh, the committee, uh, pardon me, that the, the House continue to recognize the role of states that in, in setting standards uh, for water quality and waters that they control. Uh, and so I would urge adoption of my amendment. And I, before I close, I do, though, want to um, thank Chairman Lobiondo. We worked very hard over the last several weeks at trying to come to a resolution of this matter. We were unable to get there, but it was not for lack of trying. And I, I thank the chairman uh, and the ranking members for their efforts to, uh, to bring this matter to a bipartisan resolution. I'm sorry we couldn't get there, uh, but uh, as I say, it was not for lack of trying. With that, I reserve the balance of my time. Gentleman's time is reserved. Gentleman from New Jersey. Claim the time in opposition. Gentleman is recognized. Um, Mr. Speaker, I, I appreciate what um, Mr. Bishop is, uh, is attempting to do, and, and we did give it a, a mighty effort to try to reach an agreement. It's, um, it's one of those situations where we just have a different point of view, and I, it, it is my opinion that this am amendment would make the current situation even worse because it would allow states to completely prohibit the discharge of ballast water if they chose to, regardless of what technology was installed on a vessel. So here's the situation. You could have a vessel owner could install technology worth millions of dollars that would treat ballast water to one million times the standard in the bill, and you could still have a state come in and say, we're going to prohibit the vessel from discharging. Uh, it completely undermines the uniform standards that we're attempting to accomplish. The amendment would also allow states to dictate how much ballast water could be discharged, the depth of the water where the discharge is permitted, and even what hours of the day. Um, I, th I think, and uh, again, my opinion is that this amendment would completely undermine our efforts to put in place a single uniform national ballast water standard uh, and that if this amendment were to go forward, it would actually gut this portion of it. So uh, I urge all members to oppose the amendment, and I reserve the balance of my time. Gentleman's time is reserved. Gentleman from New York. May I inquire as to how much time I have left? Gentleman has one minute remaining. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let me quickly uh, and, and respectfully, I, I believe that my colleague and friend from New Jersey has mischaracterized uh, pieces of the amendment. Let me be make clear. Um, the, the amendment would, um, 
would not allow states to require the insulation of, I'm quoting from the amendment, would not allow states to require the insulation of ballast water treatment technology that differs from that required by the standard specified under subsection C, in other words, what the, what the uh, underlying bill provides, and they could not uh, impose standards in, until they had applied to the administrator and the secretary, and they would have to determine that the waters of the state require greater environmental protection. So this would be a state um, a state request to the EPA and, and finally uh, the administrator and the secretary by the language of this amendment could not approve a state operational requirement if that requirement A would have an unreasonable impact on the use of traditional shipping lanes or B would prohibit the discharge of ballast waters in all waters of the state. This is a very narrowly crafted effort to provide at least some role for the states subject to the approval of, of, um, of the federal government. And Gentleman with that, I yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman's time has expired. Gentleman from New Jersey. Uh, Mr. Speaker, how much time do I have left? Gentleman has three and one half minutes remaining. Uh, yield one minute to Mr. Bouchon. Gentleman is recognized for one and one half minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise today in opposition to Mr. Bishop's amendment and subsequently Mr. Dingell's amendment also affecting the uniform national standard of ballast water discharge. This legislation creates a national standard that we desperately need. Currently, each state is able to create its own rules and regulations for ballast water discharge. The state of New York recently enacted extreme new ballast water requirements that are 100 times more stringent than the international standards. After extensive study, the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources determined that the technology does not exist to meet this standard. If allowed to go into effect, these regulations would cost Indiana approximately 8,800 jobs while doing little to protect the Great Lakes from invasive species. On September 7th, Governor Daniels of Indiana joined Wisconsin Governor Walker and Ohio Governor Kasich in submitting a letter to New York Governor Cuomo opposing the New York's extreme new ballast requirements. I ask unanimous consent to submit that letter to the Objection, so ordered. So I urge all my colleagues to save maritime jobs, not only in Indiana, but across the Great Lakes, and vote against these two amendments. Thank you, and I yield back my time. Gentleman from New Jersey. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I yield such time as he may consume to Mr. La Tourette. Gentleman is recognized from Ohio. I, I thank the chairman for yielding, and I, I thank the, uh, the chairman for recognition. And I rise with great affection uh, for my friends from New York, both Mr. Bishop and Ms. Slaughter. But I have to set the table on what, what this is about. The Coast Guard has been promulgating a federal standard in line with the international maritime standard for the discharge of ballast water. And despite what people say, uh, they say a new invasive species comes into the lakes every 28 days. That's true, but they don't come in in the ballast water of ships because industry, governments, both American and Canadian, and the states have worked hard to make sure that that does not occur. But in the face of that, uh, an organization called the New York Department of Environmental Conservation proposed regulations, as Mr. Bouchon said, that when fully implemented would, would be 1,000 more times stringent than the IMO standards. And what that effectively means is, and when you talk to these folks, they say, well, that's the great, that's the great mother of invention. If we put these standards out there, the great mother of invention, they're going to invent something. But sadly for New York, their vendor, the one that they were counting on for this technology, said they're not even willing to, to have it be tested by a third party for verification that it works. So this amendment and those proposals would basically shut down waterborne commerce in the United States of America. Will the gentleman, will the gentleman yield when... I'll be happy to finish that. The gentleman's time has expired. Two and a half minutes expired? He had a minute and a half. He yielded me such time as he, I may consume. I thought he had two and a half minutes left. Stand corrected. The gentleman may continue. That's, thank you so much. <laughs> Listen, I'll, I'll yield to you in just a second. 20 Mr. seconds. Bitt. Just a second. But, but, but here's the skinny. Uh, New York, is, is their regulations are more obnoxious because they cover uh, just passage. You don't have to take a, a dime of ballast water in or a drop in if you're in New York waters, and you don't have to discharge a drop. Just the mere fact of sailing through New York waters, which you have to do uh, in the Great Lakes, uh, would cause these regulations to come into effect. Now, uh, I had to go to the extraordinary length of offering an amendment in the Interior Appropriations Bill that said if New York continues on this crazy course, that they get no money out of the Interior Appropriations Bill. Now, that wasn't designed to cheat our friends in New York out of funds. Okay. That was designed to get their attention. We have their attention. We have to work together to solve this in a bipartisan way. 
this amendment and the next amendment are not going to do that, and I'm happy to yield to my friend. I, I appreciate my friend from Ohio for yielding. I want to be clear. What, what Mr. LaTourette is describing is the current state of affairs. The underlying bill would change the current state of affairs, yep. and the amendment that I'm seeking to the underlying bill would render the New York State standards moot because it would accept the technological standards imposed in the underlying bill. So the New York standards, as ambitious as they are, would go away. What this would simply say is that New York and other states that are interested, such as California, such as Michigan, could establish certain operational requirements subject to the approval of the EPA that would allow for the protection of certain waters in the state. Now my time's expired. Gentleman's time has expired. I really had something pithy to say, but we'll continue this later. I thank the chair. Question is on the amendment offered by the gentleman from New York. Those in favor say aye. Those opposed, no. no. Penny of the chair, the noes have it. The Mr. amendment is not agreed Mr. to. Mr. Chairman, on that I request the yeas and nays. Clause 6 of Rule 18, further proceedings on the amendment offered by the gentleman from New York will be postponed. It is now in order to consider amendment number 8, printed in House Report 112-267. For what purpose does a gentlewoman from New York seek recognition? Uh, Mr. Chair, as a designee of Mr. Dingell of Michigan, I offer an amendment. The clerk will designate the amendment. Amendment number eight, printed in House Report number 112-267, offered by Ms. Slaughter of New York. Pursuant to House Resolution 455, the gentlelady from New York, Ms. Slaughter, and a member opposed, we each will control five minutes. The chair recognizes the gentlelady from New York. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I rise today to offer an amendment with my distinguished colleague from Michigan, Mr. Dingell, which would remove a controversial measure that has been inserted into the underlying Coast Guard reauthorization. The measure forces states to adopt a weak international balance of water standard as a ceiling for regulatory efforts. In doing so, it preempts the right of states to respond to emerging invasive species and provides no incentive for future innovation in critical ballast water technology. Each minute, 40,000 gallons of ballast water containing thousands and millions of foreign bacteria, viruses, animals, and plants are discharged into the U.S. waters. That's 21 billion gallons of ballast water annually. Once introduced, invasive species such as the Asian carp are exceedingly difficult to control and often impossible to eradicate. Having no natural predators, aquatic invasive species easily feed on the native fish and other aquatic wildlife. They foul beaches, degrade fisheries, clog, clog water intake pipes and other infrastructure. They disrupt the food chains and contaminate our drinking water and we spend more than a billion dollars a year simply trying to get rid of zebra mussels, which to date we have spent five billion trying to eradicate and have not even come close. Ballast water is a serious matter with far-reaching implications for this nation. We lose billions of taxpayer dollars every year to combat and contain invasive species brought into our water by foreign shipping vessels. Many, and all, most all, around the Great Lakes of our nation's communities relies on, on these bodies of water uh, for recreation, to drink, as well as their livelihood. The Great Lakes, which face significant challenges from invasive species, contain 20% of the fresh water on the planet. And I think those of us on both sides of the aisle who live adjacent to those lakes have always felt an obligation to be, try to protect that. And we must also remember that those are international waters and that our Canadian friends also have a say here. Unfortunately, the ballast water provisions in this measure protect the foreign shipping magnets rather than the Great Lakes and the people who live there. The Dingle Slaughter Amendment strikes Title VII from this measure, which will remove the damaging ballast water language. This amendment will allow us to pass the important Coast Guard reauthorization while giving Congress an opportunity to come to a responsible and reasonable agreement with respect to ballast water standards. I urge my colleagues to support the Dingle Slaughter Amendment, and Mr. Chair, I reserve the balance of my time. Gentleman reserves who seeks time in opposition? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I claim the time in opposition. The gentleman from New Jersey is recognized. Uh, I yield Mr. LaTourette such time as he may consume. The gentleman from Ohio is recognized.
I, I thank the chair, and again, I rise with great affection for most, both Mr. Dingle and Ms. Slaughter, who are wonderful colleagues and friends in this House. But this amendment is the Bishop Amendment on steroids. And, and so this amendment, unlike the Bishop Amendment, would go back and remove, remove the requirement that's in the bill, and New York would be free to go about its business and shut down waterborne commerce in the Great Lakes. Now, the sad thing for the state of New York, and I know the people in New York think that they are pretty important and they run the whole place, but they don't. And sadly, we have five Great Lakes that flow through and touch a number of states, Ohio being inclusive in that. And, and just a couple of observations. You know, this, this, isn't, this isn't a bunch of uh, uh, people that don't like the Great Lakes versus a bunch of environmentalists that want to pr protect it. The very first piece of legislation I had signed into law by President Clinton, and it's tough to get a bill signed into law by a president of the other party, was the reauthorization of the National Invasive Species Act, co-authored by John Glenn in the United States Senate. I know invasive species, but I'm going to tell you, because of the work of John Glenn and because of the work of a lot of good people since 1995, I challenge anybody offering this amendment to come up with one invasive species that has gotten into the Great Lakes and, and this notion that it's 28 days. Yeah, they come in in boats, they come in people's boots, they come like swimming from other places. The biggest threat we got is the Asian carp. It's not coming in ballast water, it's swimming up the Mississippi and we got to fight with the president about whether or not we have an electronic barrier that keeps these awful fish out of the Great Lakes. Now, the longshoremen don't like what New York is doing. So if labor is not up, you know, uh, on board with what Ms. Slaughter and Mr. Dingle are attempting to do. And a July 2011, so fresh off the charts, an evaluation by the United States uh, Environmental Protection Agency determined that the technology does not exist. Does not exist. Even if the ship owner had a bazillion dollars and wanted to buy something off the shelf, it doesn't exist to meet the water quality level stipulated by New York. Uh, for this reason, the maritime industry, together with labor, believes that these regulations are unworkable and if left unchanged will cause economic harm when they come into effect, resulting in complete cessation of commercial maritime commerce in New York waters. Now, at a time when everybody around the country is screaming about jobs, what are we going to do? All the longshoremen, you don't have to work anymore. The guys that drive the boats, you don't need any work anymore. Folks that unload the boats, no, you don't need to work anymore. Why? Because one state out of the eight states that border the Great Lakes has decided to come up with something not passed by their legislature, passed by this New York Environmental Council. It's crazy. And we, again, in a good bipartisan way, need to work together to fix this problem. Let's find the right way to keep the zebra mussel and the round goby and the sea lamprey and the Asian carp out of the Great Lakes. But to allow New York to go down this path with the passage of this amendment is destructive to jobs in the Great Lakes, and I hope that it is defeated. And I yield back to the chairman. Gentleman yields back. I also appreciate recognizing my steroids. The gentlelady from New York. <laughs> Mr. Chair, I'm uh, pleased to yield two minutes to the gentleman from Michigan, who cares as much as anybody from New York, the Dean of the House and co-sponsor of the amendment, Mr. Dingle. The gentleman from Michigan is recognized for two minutes. Mr. Chairman, I ask unanimous consent to rise and extend my remarks. Without objection, so ordered. Mr. Chairman, this is a very important question. The Great Lakes are 20 percent of the world's freshwater supply. It is endangered, and the fish and wildlife in the whole eco ecosystem are endangered by the constant entry of imported species that come in in the ballast water of ships entering the Great Lakes. What we're talking about here is protecting something of enormous value that has been here since geological times and which has provided enormous opportunities for our people. And uh, food, and all manner of things, including recreation, transportation, fish, and wildlife. This process of trying to give a few bones to a bunch of importers who are bringing these things in from the Black Sea and other places in Europe is a shameful thing if permitted. The United States and the Congress have not done the job that we should have done to protect our Great Lakes. And already, we have a large number of things, including some nasty diseases like viral hemorrhagic septicemia, sort of the Ebola virus of fish. And this is something that we have to protect our Great Lakes against and other waters of the United States. Uh, 
Foreign shippers are going to be bringing in dirty ballast water, discharging it into our Great Lakes. If the states want to spend the time protecting the state's water and the interest in the Great Lakes or other bodies of water which are threatened by these practices want to do it, the Congress should very well permit them to do it because failure to do it is going to jeopardize 20% of the world's fresh water and more importantly, a resource which is recreational, which is, relates to fish and wildlife values, and which provides us with opportunity for transportation, drinking water, and a whole array of other precious and important things. And if we don't adopt this amendment, we find we're taking care of a bunch of foreign ship owners instead of our people and the future of the United States. Support the amendment. The gentleman's time has expired. The gentleman from New Jersey. How much time do we have left, Mr. Chairman? The gentleman from New Jersey has two minutes left. The gentlelady from New York has 30 seconds left. Um, I yield Mr. La Tourette such time as he may consume. The gentleman from Ohio is recognized. I, I thank the chairman again. And again, I, I have nothing but affection for Mr. Dingle and Ms. Slaughter. But on this issue, respectfully, I, I wow. thank you. And it's, it's mutual. And Louise likes me too. But listen, here, here's the deal. There's not going to be anybody recreating on the Great Lakes, fishing and all the wonderful things that we get to do on Lake Erie, Lake Michigan, Lake Superior, Lake Huron, uh, because nobody's going to be working. Uh, and so without jobs, uh, people are not going to have the opportunity to enjoy the splendor of 28% of the world's fresh water. Again, sadly, people in New York, people in New York have decided they want to come up with a standard that nobody can meet. Now, in 2013, when fully implemented, what does that mean? That means a boat comes down the St. Lawrence Seaway and travels into New York, and if you can't meet their standard 1,000 times more stringent than the international standard, guess what? You can't sail. The people can't sail on the ship. The people can't put goods on the ship. Now, I, I again, despite my affection for the, the authors of this amendment, I've talked to the longshoremen, I've talked to the Canadians, I've talked to the people in the St. Lawrence Seaway, and they say that the problem with invasive species today in the Great Lakes isn't ballast water, it's the Asian carp swimming up the Mississippi River, and it's things brought in from other sources. It's not ballast water. It's not ballast water because Republicans and Democrats, since the beginning of my time here, 18 years, have worked together to get this right. This is wrong, and I urge that it be defeated, and I thank the chairman for yielding to me. Gentleman yields back. Gentleman from New York has 30 seconds remaining. Uh, may I inquire if my colleague is prepared to close? Or shall I reserve my yes. time? Yes. Do you have further speakers? Me. All right, let me... Uh, then I'll let me close. Uh, Mr. Speaker, we have to allow states, as we always have, to have a voice uh, in protecting their ecosystems and economies. As long as we conform to the federal law, uh, we have always been able in states to en enhance them. But if we're willing to really truly solve this threat of invasive species in our waters, and I personally believe it's quite serious, because both in my time in state legislature and federal legislature, that was certainly pointed out to me. I urge my colleagues to support the Dingle Slaughter Amendment, and I'm pleased to yield back the balance of my time. Gentlelady, gentlelady yields back her time. Gentleman from New Jersey. Mr. Speaker, I strongly, strongly, strongly oppose this amendment. This current regulatory nightmare will shut down, shut down our shipping lanes. It is unworkable. Uh, and I hope our colleagues understand the consequences uh, if this amendment were to pass. Uh, I, uh, I urge opposition to the amendment, and I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back the balance of his time. Question is on the amendment offered by the gentlelady from New York. Those in favor say aye. Those opposed say no. No. The opinion of the chair, the noes have it. Mr. Speaker, on that, I ask for the ayes and nays. Pursuant to Clause 6 of Rule 18, further proceedings on the amendment offered by the gentlelady from New York will be postponed. It's now in order to consider Amendment Number 9, printed in House Report 112-267. There you are.
For what purpose does the gentleman from Michigan seek recognition? Uh, I rise today, Mr. Speaker, uh, in uh, support of the Heisinger P. Tri Beneshek Amendment. I'm uh, sorry, uh, uh, Mr. Speaker, I have an amendment at the desk. The clerk will designate the amendment. Amendment number nine, printed in House Report number 112 267, offered by Mr. Heisinga of Michigan. Pursuant to House resolution, resolution 455, the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Heisinga, and a member opposed, each will control five minutes. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Michigan for his opening presentation. Uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, Mr. Speaker. I uh, yield myself uh, such time as I may consume uh, and uh, also ask permission to revise and extend those remarks. Without objection, so ordered. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise today in support of my amendment along with the co-leads, uh, Tom Ch uh, Petri, Chairman Petri from Wisconsin, and uh, Congressman Dan Beneshek of Michigan. Uh, today, uh, we're talking about a particular ship, the SS Badger, uh, located in Ludington, Michigan. It travels between Ludington and Manitowoc, Wisconsin. This particular ship has been operating on the Great Lakes for over 50 years, most recently coming back into service in 1991, using all private dollars to make that happen. Its uniqueness is recognized by the uh, designation of the National Register of Historic Places and by both the states of Wisconsin and Michigan. Its propulsion system is recognized as a mechanical engineering landmark by the American Society of Mechanical Engineers. The Badger is currently operating under special rules developed by the EPA in 2008. Uh, these rules are set to expire at the end of 2012, and without certainty provided by this amendment, uh, the Badger could very easily, frankly, be forced off the Great Lakes at the end of 2012. With an annual economic impact of roughly $35 million for our two small port cities, both in Wisconsin and in Michigan, uh, keeping the Badger operational is absolutely vital to our communities. I urge all of my uh, colleagues today to join us in recognizing the historic significance of these Great Lakes steamships by supporting the Heisinger, Petri, and Beneshek Amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gentleman reserves. Uh, I reserve the balance of my time. Gentleman reserves. Who seeks opposition? Time in opposition. This is a gentleman from Michigan. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. At this time, I uh, recognize my colleague, uh, Tom, Chairman Tom Petri from Wisconsin. Thank my colleague for offering the amendment. Rise in support of it and uh, uh, yield back. Uh, gentleman yields back. Does the gentleman from Michigan wish to yield back? Uh, uh, actually, at this time, uh, Mr. Chair, I'd like to recognize uh, my fellow congressman from Michigan, uh, Representative Dan Beneshek, uh, for some remarks. The gentleman from Michigan is recognized. Thank you. I thank the gentleman for yielding. I appreciate my fellow freshman and colleague from Michigan for his leadership on this issue. Mr. Speaker, this is a simple amendment that addresses a growing problem with our friends at the EPA, their love of bureaucratic red tape. I represent a district with more Great Lakes coastline than any other. Shipping and ferries are a part of the Great Lakes heritage. USS Badger continues this tradition, transporting travelers, cars, trucks, and equipment across Lake Michigan. Don't be confused. This amendment does not make the Badger exempt from EPA regulations. The EPA will continue to regulate discharge limits and other requirements. It simply keeps in place the current regulations that recognize the Badger as a unique and historic vessel. Keeping the Badger operational means savings a million gallons of fuel a year from vehicles driving around the lake. Passing this amendment is simple and common sense. It allows a natural historic, national historic place to continue to function on the Great Lakes. I urge passage and yield back. Gentleman yields back. Gentleman from Michigan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. At this time, I yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman yields back. The question is on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Michigan. Those in favor say aye. Those opposed, no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. The amendment is agreed to. It is now in order to consider amendment number 10, printed in the House Report 112-267. For what purpose does the gentleman from Texas seek recognition? Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk and ask for its immediate consideration. Clerk will designate the amendment. Amendment number 10, printed in House Report number 112-267, offered by Mr. Olson of Texas. Pursuant to House Resolution 455, the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Olson, and a member opposed, each will control five minutes. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Texas. 
Mr. Speaker, I believe that issuing a mandate of this nature without proper study to determine if it will increase safety would be problematic. No one takes safety more seriously than the companies operating offshore. Since Deepwater Horizon, multiple safeguards have been put in place to ensure worker safety. I simply believe that the Coast Guard should have an opportunity to assess a provision of this nature before we establish an arbitrary mandate that they'll have to comply with. This amendment does not, does not prevent us from implementing measures to ensure worker safety. It simply requires a six-month study first to allow the Coast Guard to analyze the safety benefits so that we can provide the safest environment for our offshore drilling workers. The Coast Guard may determine that standby vessels should be required. If so, I will work to ensure that happens. I'm just asking that we review this issue thoroughly and prudently before we rush to legislate. However, at this time, I understand the need to withdraw my amendment and appreciate Chairman Micah's willingness to work with me to address my concerns as we work through the legislative process. I also appreciate the gentleman from Louisiana, whose provision of the bill I sought to improve with my amendment. I'm grateful for his commitment to work with me, work with me on our differences. I reserve the balance of my time. Does the gentleman seek to withdraw his amendment? Uh, I ask him to ask consent to withdraw my amendment. Without objection, so ordered. Pursuant to Clause 6 of Rule 18, proceedings will now resume on those amendments printed in House Report 112-267, on which further proceedings were postponed in the following order. Amendment number 3 by Mr. Cummings of Maryland. Amendment number 4 by Mr. Thompson of Mississippi. Amendment number 6 by Ms. Napolitano of California, Amendment No. 7 by Mr. Bishop of New York, and Amendment No. 8 by Ms. Slaughter of New York. The chair will reduce to two minutes the time for any electronic vote after the first vote in the series. The unfinished business is the request for recorded vote on Amendment No. 3 printed in the House Report 112-267 by the gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Cummings, on which further proceedings were postponed and on which the nays prevailed by voice vote. The clerk will redesignate the amendment. Amendment number three, printed in House Report number 112-267, offered by Mr. Cummings of Maryland. A recorded vote has been requested. Those in support of the request for a recorded vote will rise and be counted. Okay. Sufficient number having risen, a recorded vote is ordered. Members will record their votes by electronic device, and this will be a 15-minute vote. On the last day before the House heads into their district work period, they've been debating today the reauthorization of Coast Guard programs and policies, the Coast Guard reauthorization bill, and the, the uh, some 18 amendments, and they're going to vote on up to uh, six of them here. This first one is 15 minutes, an amendment by... Elijah Cummings of Maryland, which would strike a provision in the bill eliminating an existing requirement that the Coast Guard appoint an ombudsman in each Coast Guard district. Fifteen minute vote, and again, a number of other amendment votes to follow, and those will all be two minute votes. Earlier today, we talked with Rob Margetta from uh, Congressional Quarterly about this bill and asked him why the Obama administration opposes it. What they object to is there's a passage that would require the uh, Department of Homeland Security or the Coast Guard to decommission um, the only two heavy-duty polar icebreakers that the U.S. has in its possession. Why are supporters of the bill proposing decommissioning these vessels? Well, there, there's been a, a uh, concern about icebreakers and the, the uh, uh, the polar region in Congress for years now. Um, the, the bill actually just says to decommission uh, one that's functioning within three, uh, three years. Uh, one that currently is not functioning is uh, scheduled to be um, decommissioned in six months, according to the bill. Um, and there, there's been talk of having some sort of larger focus on um, rebuilding polar resources, but the bill actually doesn't uh, give any sort of provision for replacing them with icebreakers. And, and the supporters, in addition to the White House, who are the supporters of keeping the icebreakers, and what will they, they be saying about why the U.S. needs them? 
Well, for one thing, there are supporters in the Senate. Uh, the, the Senate version of the Coast Guard reauthorization bill actually has a provision that would uh, bar the Coast Guard from decommissioning either of these vehicles, um, which is actually uh, sort of ironic because the Coast Guard wants to keep one and wants to decommission uh, the other, which uh, was damaged during a test of its engines and is considered to be uh, very difficult, if not impossible, to repair. The argument here is that uh, the Arctic Ocean has really opened up as a shipping lane uh, and also for uh, additional research, and that the U.S. needs the capability to protect uh, its vessels. Are there there other areas in general that the House and Senate versions are are different or uh, or much the same? Uh, you know, they're they're both very complicated bills, uh, and and they tend to have more similarities and differences. This is really sort of a, a, a big one that the administration picked up that hasn't gotten a lot of focus, at least in the House. Will the, the House finish work on the bill today? Um, it, you know, too soon to tell. Rob Marget is with Congressional Quarterly covering debate ahead on the, Congress, on the Coast Guard reauthorization bill. Thanks for the update. Thank you very much. And the House is voting on the, the first of uh, up to a half dozen votes on amendments to the Coast Guard reauthorization bill. This first vote is 15 minutes, and the remaining votes will be uh, two-minute votes. President Obama is returning from the two-day G20 meetings in France on his way back. But before leaving, he held a news conference to uh, take questions from reporters about the discussions over the past two days that have focused on the Eurozone crisis there, the financial crisis in Europe. We'll show you as much as we can of the president's comments during this first 15-minute vote. Good afternoon, everybody. I want to begin by thanking my friend President Sarkozy for his leadership and his hospitality. And I want to thank the people of Khan for this extraordinary setting. Over the past two years, those of us in the G20 have worked together to rescue the global economy, to avert another depression, and to put us on the path to recovery. But we came to Khan with no illusions. The recovery has been fragile. And since our last meeting in Seoul, we've experienced a number of new shocks, disruptions in oil supplies, the tragic tsunami in Japan, and the financial crisis in Europe. As a result, advanced economies, including the United States, are growing and creating jobs, but not nearly fast enough. Emerging economies have started to slow. Global demand is weakening. Around the world, hundreds of millions of people are unemployed or underemployed. Put simply, the world faces challenges that put our economic recovery at risk. So the central question coming into Khan was this. Uh, could the world's largest economies confront this challenge squarely? Uh, understanding that these problems will not be solved overnight, could we make progress? After two days of very substantive discussions, I can say that we've come together and made important progress to put our econ uh, economic recoveries on a firmer footing. With respect to Europe, we came to Khan to discuss with our European friends how they will move forward and build upon the plan they agreed to last week to resolve this crisis. Uh, events in Greece over the past 24 hours have underscored the importance of implementing the plan fully and as quickly as possible. Having heard from our European partners over the past two days, uh, I am confident that Europe has the capacity to meet this challenge. I know it isn't easy, uh, but what is absolutely critical and what the world looks for in moments such as this is action. That's how we confronted our financial crisis in the United States, having our banks submit to stress tests that were rigorous, increasing capital buffers, and passing the strongest financial reforms since the Great Depression. Uh, none of that was easy, and it certainly wasn't always popular. But we did what was necessary to address the crisis, put ourselves on a stronger footing, and to help rescue the global economy. And that's the challenge that Europe now faces. Uh, make no mistake, there is more hard work ahead and more difficult choices to make. But our European partners have laid a foundation on which to build, and it has all the elements needed for success. A credible fire, firewall to prevent the crisis from spreading, strengthening European banks, charting a sustainable path for Greece, and confronting the structural issues that are at the heart of the current crisis. 
Uh, and here in Cannes, we moved the ball forward. Uh, Europe remains on track to implement a sustainable path for Greece. Italy has agreed to a monitoring program with the IMF, in fact, invited it. Uh, tools have been identified that will better enable the world to support European action. And European finance ministers will carry this work forward next week. All of us have an enormous interest in Europe's success, and all of us will be affected if Europe is not growing. And that certainly includes the United States, which counts Europe as our largest trading partner. If Europe isn't growing, it's harder for us to do what we need to do for the American people, creating jobs, lifting up the middle class, and putting our fiscal house in order. And that's why I've made it clear that the United States will continue uh, to do our part to support our European partners as they work to resolve this crisis. Uh, more broadly, we agreed to stay focused on jobs and growth uh, with an action plan in which each nation does its part. In the United States, we recognize that the, as the world's largest economy, the most important thing we can do for uh, global growth is to get our own economy growing faster. Back home, we're fighting for the American Jobs Act, which will put people back to work even as we meet our responsibilities to reduce our deficit in the coming years. Uh, we also made progress here in Cannes on our rebalancing agenda in an important step forward. Countries with large surpluses and export-oriented countries agreed to take additional steps to support growth and boost demand in their own countries. In addition, we welcome China's determination to increase the flexibility of the RMB. Uh, this is something we've been calling for for some time, and it will be a critical step in boosting growth. Uh, finally, we also made progress across a range of challenges to our shared prosperity. Following our reforms in the United States, the G20 adopted an unprecedented set of high-level financial reforms to prevent a crisis in the future. We agreed to keep phasing out fossil fuel subsidies, perhaps the single most important step we can take in the near term to uh, fight climate change and create clean energy economies. And even as our countries work to save lives from the drought and terrible famine in the Horn of Africa, we agreed on the need to mobilize new resources to support the development that lifts nations out of poverty. So again, I want to thank uh, President Sarkozy and our French hosts for a productive summit. I want to thank my fellow leaders for their partnership and for the progress we've made to create the jobs and prosperity that our people deserve. So with that, uh, let me take a few questions. Uh, I'll start with uh, Jim Coonan uh, of AP. Uh, new jobless numbers today back in the States. Uh, you're on a pace to face um, the voters with the highest unemployment rate of any post-war president. And uh, doesn't that make you significantly vulnerable to a Republican who might run uh, on, a, on a message of change? And if I may add, uh, given that you have just witnessed the difficulties uh, of, of averting economic problems beyond your control, um, what state do you think the economy will be in when, uh, when you face re-election next year? Uh, Jim, I have to tell you, uh, the least of my concerns at the moment uh, is the politics of a year from now. Uh, I'm worried about putting people back to work right now because those folks are hurting and the U.S. economy is underperforming. And so everything that we're doing here in the United, uh, here in, uh, uh, at the G20 uh, mirrors our efforts back home. And that is, how do we boost growth? How do we shrink our deficits in a way that doesn't slow the recovery right now? Uh, how do we make sure that uh, our workers are getting the skills and the training they need to compete uh, in a global economy? And uh, not only does the American Jobs Act uh, answer some of the needs for jobs now, uh, but it will also uh, lay the foundation for future growth through uh, investments in infrastructure, for example. So uh, you know, my hope is, is that the folks back home, including those in the United States Senate and the House of Representatives, when they look at today's job numbers, which were positive, but indicate once again that the economy is growing way too slow, uh, that they think twice before they vote no again on 
the only proposal out there right now that independent economists say would actually make a dent in unemployment right now. Uh, there's no excuse for inaction. Uh, that's true globally. It's certainly true uh, back home as well, and I'm going to keep on pushing it uh, regardless of what the politics are. Chuck Todd. Thank, thank you, Mr. President. Um, clearly, there was some sort of dispute between you and the European leaders about how to fund this bailout, and you, in your, in your remarks, emphasized the fact that TARP was done with U.S. funds, that there wasn't, there wasn't any international involvement here. Are you confident now that the European leaders are going to fund this firewall or bailout fund themselves, not looking for handouts from other countries, and that they will do what they have to do? And the second part of my question is, how hard was it to convince these folks to do stimulus measures? When your own stimulus measure, you've mentioned it twice now, is not going anywhere right now on Capitol Hill. Uh, we're, well, first of all, we didn't have a long conversation about stimulus measures, so that was maybe two or three uh, G20s ago. Uh, we had a discussion about what steps could be taken to continue to spur economic growth, and that may not always involve government spending. For example, the rebalancing agenda that I talked about is, is one way in which we can make a big difference uh, in spurring on global demand. Uh, it requires some adjustments some changes in behavior uh, on the part of countries. Uh, but uh, it, it doesn't necessarily involve classic fiscal stimulus. Um, there wasn't a dispute with the Europeans. I think uh, the Europeans agree with us that it is important uh, to send a clear signal that the European project is alive and well and that they are committed to the euro. Uh, and that they are committed to resolving this crisis. And I think if you talk to European leaders, they are the first ones to say uh, that it, that begins uh, with European leaders arriving at uh, a common course of action. So uh, essentially what we've seen is uh, all the elements for dealing with the crisis put in place, and we think those are the right elements. The first is... Uh, having a solution to the specific problem of Greece. Uh, and although the actions of uh, Papandreou uh, and the referendum issue over the last couple of days, uh, I think, uh, got a lot of people nervous, uh, the truth is that the, the, the general approach, which involved uh, a voluntary reduction uh, on the part of uh, those who hold Greeks' debt, uh, you know, reducing uh, the obligations of the Greek government, Greece continuing with reforms uh, and structural change, that's the right recipe. It just has to be carried out. And I was encouraged by the fact that despite all the turmoil in Greece, even the opposition leader in Greece indicated that uh, it's important to move forward on the proposal. Uh, the second component is recapitalization of Europe's banks. And they have identified that need, and they are resourcing that need. Uh, and uh, you know, that, I think, is going to be critical to further instill confidence in the markets. And the third part of it is uh, creating this firewall, essentially sending a signal to the markets that Europe is going to stand behind the euro. Uh, and the, all the details, the structure, uh, uh, how it operates are still being worked out among the European leaders. What we were able to do was to give them some ideas uh, uh, some options in terms of how they would put that together. Uh, and what we've said is, uh, and this, I'm speaking now for the, the whole of the G20, uh, what we've said is the international community is going to uh, stand ready to assist and uh, make sure that uh, the uh, overall global economy is cushioned by the gyrations in the market and the shocks uh, that arise as Europe is working these issues through. Uh, and so they're going to have a strong partner in us. But European leaders understand that ultimately uh, what the markets are looking for is a strong signal from Europe that they're standing behind uh, the euro. No, what, what we were saying is that, and this is reflected in the communique, that, uh, for example, creating additional tools for the IMF is an important component of providing 
uh, markets overall confidence in global growth uh, and stability. But uh, that is a supplement to the work that is being done here in Europe. Uh, and uh, based on my conversations with President Sarkozy, Chancellor Merkel, uh, and all the other European leaders, uh, I believe they have that strong commitment uh, to the Euro and the European project. David Muir. Thank you, Mr. President. I'm curious what you would say to Americans back home who've watched their 401ks recover largely when the bailout seemed a certainty, and then this week with the brand new political tumult in Greece, watched themselves lose essentially what they had gained back. You mentioned you're confident in the bailout plan. Are you confident this will actually happen, and if so, that it will work? Well, first of all, uh, uh, if you're talking about uh, the movements of the U.S. stock market, um, you know, the, the, the stock market was down uh, when I first took office in the first few months I was in office, uh, about 3,000 points lower than it is now. So uh, nothing's happened in the last two weeks uh, that would uh, suggest that somehow um, people's 401ks have been affected the way you described. Um, am I confident that this will work? I think that there's more work to do. Uh, I think there are going to be some ups and downs uh, along the way. Uh, but I am confident that uh, the uh, key players in Europe, the European uh, political leadership, understands how much of a stake they have in making sure that this crisis is resolved, that uh, the Eurozone remains intact, uh, and I think that they are going to do what's necessary in order to make that happen. Now, uh, let's, uh, you know, let's recognize uh, how difficult this is. Uh, you know, I have sympathy for uh, my European counterparts. We saw how difficult it was for us to save the financial system back in the United States uh, it did not do wonders for uh, uh, anybody's uh, political standing uh, because people's general attitude is, you know what, if the financial uh, sector uh, is behaving recklessly or not making good decisions, uh, other folks shouldn't have to suffer for it. Uh, you layer on top of that the fact that you're negotiating with uh, multiple parliaments, uh, a European parliament, a European Commission. Uh, I mean, there are just a lot of institutions here in Europe. Uh, and uh, uh, I, you know, uh, I think uh, several, uh, I think, I'm not sure whether it was Sarkozy or Merkel or Barroso or somebody, they, uh, uh, they joked with me that I'd gotten a crash course in European politics uh, over the last several days. Uh, the, uh, and there are a lot of meetings here in Europe as well. So, so trying to coordinate all those different interests uh, is laborious. It's time-consuming. Uh, but I think they're going to get there. What is also positive is you know, if, if there's a silver lining in this whole process, it's the fact that uh, I think European leaders recognize that there are some structural reforms, institutional modifications they need to make uh, if uh, Europe and the Eurozone is to be as effective uh, as they want it to be. Uh, I, I think that what this has exposed is that if you have a single currency but you haven't worked out all the institutional coordination uh, and relationships between countries uh, on the fiscal side, on the monetary side, that that creates additional vulnerabilities. Uh, and there's a commitment on the part of European leaders, I think, to examine uh, those issues. But those are long term. In the short term, what they've got to do is just make sure that they're sending a signal to, uh, to, uh, to the markets that uh, they stand behind the euro. Uh, and if that message is sent, then uh, I think this crisis uh, is averted because some of this crisis is psychological. Uh, I mean, Italy is a big country with an enormous uh, industrial base, uh, great wealth, great assets, uh, and uh, has had 
substantial debt for quite some time. It's just the market uh, is feeling skittish right now. Uh, and that's why I think uh, uh, Prime Minister Berlusconi's uh, invitation to the IMF to certify that the reform plan that they've put in place is one that they will, in fact, follow uh, is an example of the, the steady confidence-building measures that need to, uh, need to take place in order for us to get back on track. Nora O'Donnell. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, the world leaders here have stressed growth, the importance of growth, and yet growth back at home has been anemic. The new jobs report today showing just 88,000 jobs added. The Republicans in Congress have made it clear that they're going to block your jobs bill because they believe the tax hikes in it hurt small businesses. At what point do you feel that you declare stalemate to try and reach common ground? And do you feel like you have been an effective leader when it comes to the economy? Uh, well, uh, first of all, wherever Republicans indicate an interest in doing things that would actually grow the economy, uh, I'm right there with them. So they've said that uh, uh, passing trade bills with South Korea on this and Panama and Colombia would help spur growth. Days or 227, uh, with zero answering present, the amendment is not adopted. The unfinished business is a request for a recorded vote on amendment number four printed in the House report 112-267 by the gentleman from Mississippi, Mr. Thompson, on which further proceedings were postponed and on which the nays prevail by voice vote. The clerk will redesignate the amendment. Amendment number 